Our universe is expanding, and the rate of expansion is described by a number known as the Hubble constant. Two independent methods of measuring this should give the same answer. But in recent years, it's become increasingly clear that they don't. In particular, measurements of the cosmic microwave background by the Planck satellite give a value around 68. Measurements of distant galaxies with instruments like Hubble give a value of around 73. What's more, this tension seems to be getting worse. Does this mean there's a crisis in cosmology? Is there a simple explanation as to why one or both methods are wrong? Or is this an important sign of new physics? In this film, we'll speak to Planck team member Georges Eustathieu, astrophysicist Daniel Mortlock, theoretical cosmologist Claudia Duram, and Nobel Prize winner Adam Rees to investigate this newest puzzle for cosmology. Uh, two galaxies in our universe, this one here and this one here, and the distance between them we'll call D, and if, if we say this one here is us, and this is some other galaxy that is moving away from us with speed V because of the fact that the universe is expanding. And all Hubble's constant is, which is traditionally written as H with a little naught um, as a subscript, is just the ratio of that speed to that distance. So the Hubble constant is the name we give to the number that uh, tells us how fast the universe is expanding today at the present time. And current observation tells us that it's roughly uh, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Mega is just the usual prefix of a million, 10 to the power 6, and a parsec is about three light years. So if you really think of two objects, as we said, which are, let's say, 100, uh, one megaparsec away from one another, then we know that they will travel on average at a speed of 70 kilometers per second away from one another. The Hubble parameter hasn't remained constant throughout the history of the universe. It started at a much higher value and it has decreased for most of the period of the universe. If you take the Hubble constant and invert it, so in other words, one divided by h naught, and fiddle around with all the complicated astronomical units, then you can calculate a time that turns out to be about 14 billion years. The universe um, expanded very rapidly during an inflationary phase, and then the matter content was generated at the end of inflation. And that would be, that's when the hot big bang was created. But we, we don't really believe that there was such a thing as the energy density blowing up. That's just a lack of understanding of the physics that goes on at those energy scales. We don't know uh, what the early moments of the uh, beginning of the universe would have looked like, and we don't know what preceded those moments. You know, there wasn't a, uh, a singularity um, that defines t equals zero, you know, the beginning of the universe. There was some structure there, and, um, uh, but we don't know what it, what it was. So when we measure the Hubble parameter, it tells us how the universe has evolved since, for instance, the Big Bang. Um, and it may even tell us where it's headed to, or give us some insight into that. But also understanding how it has evolved tells us what the universe must have been made of. The main method for measuring the Hubble constant is to look around us at galaxies and see how fast they're receding from us and how far away they are. That is how we measure the Hubble constant today. Which has involved all sorts of different techniques, some of them involving local measurements in what's called the distance ladder, where you measure the distances to very nearby objects using parallax. Okay, so parallax is a geometrical measurement. So if you hold up your finger and then close one eye and then cl close the other eye, your finger appears to move. And so that angular movement depends on the distance between your finger and your nose. So you can do a similar thing looking at stars um, and looking at the way that the positions of the stars change on the sky depending on the position of the Earth in its orbit around the Sun. And uh, that um, is what uh, Gaia is doing um, to high precision. 
and then we will build up to more distant objects by using a ladder and sort of certain assumptions or knowledge we've worked out about the universe. Then the second value comes from uh, cosmology and specifically measuring the cosmic microwave background or CMB radiation. So this is the effectively the leftover glow from the Big Bang when the universe was much hotter and much denser 14 billion years ago. And it turns out that in this glow from the early universe there's information encoded about um, the nature of cosmology and the formation of structure which allows us to tell all sorts of things about the parameters that define the entire expansion history of the universe and Hubble's constant in particular. And you know my student days were scarred because there was one camp led by Alan Sandage that thought that the, uh, the value of the Hubble constant was 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec and another camp led by Gerard de Vaucalos, uh, that thought that it was 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And these two camps would just fight with each other. The uh, modern thinking um, is the value somewhere in the middle. We had estimates of the Hubble constant both from uh, cosmology, from the WMAP satellite, and then from the local distance ladder. And those estimates certainly weren't identical to each other, uh, but even though there was a difference, that difference was consistent within the uncertainties or the error bars of the two measurements. And then in the 10 years since, uh, the values have changed a little bit, in particular the value that the Planck satellite obtains is lower than that from WMAP, but the real thing that's changed is that the, uh, the precision of the measurements and the size of the data sets has both improved, and that means that these error bars have shrunk and now aren't overlapping with each other, which is why it's become one of the biggest problems in modern cosmology. Two methods, the measuring it now and predicting what it ought to be from physics and other measurements, um, those two disagree right now at about the level of 9% plus or minus 2.3%. So that starts to become pretty significant because the disagreement itself is many times the size of the error bar uh, or uncertainty in the measurement. The Hubble constant sets the age of the universe. So you need to know the Hubble constant to determine the age. The, the value that people quote 13.8 billion years is the Planck-based value. Do we live in a universe that's you know just barely 13 billion years old or more like one that's pushing 14 billion years? Turns out that's hard to answer. With our first analysis of Planck, there was a discrepancy. Five years later, the discrepancy has got worse. There's been many times where there was some tension between different measurements, between different observations, and then in the end of the day, those can go away or they can be the sign of new physics. And so we're still right now in the phase where we don't know whether it's really going to go away or if it's marking something that we really need to, uh, a new era for physics. Um, so either we can invoke new physics or there may be something wrong with the measurements. So uh, I'm very confident because we have multiple ways of approaching the uh, Planck type analysis. So I'm very confident that there's no scope, realistic scope for error. Um, and uh, then the, the, uh, the question then is, you know, is it possible that the forward distance ladder measurements, the traditional approach, um, has errors that haven't been identified. I personally think that there's plenty of scope there, um, but uh, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult. Okay, so I, uh, I've got to be careful not, <laughs> not to upset Adam. So the, the traditional approach uh, involves some very, very difficult measurements because you have to measure the brightness of uh, Cepheids in relatively, I mean, they're nearby galaxies, but even for the Hubble Space Telescope, they're at the limit of what the Hubble Space Telescope can see clearly. So the, the images are not clear images. So you have to make corrections. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm personally skeptical that all of these corrections are really understood um, at a level uh, at the level that the observers uh, uh, actually say. So the boring explanation is that there are uncertainties in the traditional approach that haven't been correctly quantified. Um, but it's, I don't have any evidence to support that. It's just a, it's just a hunch. We have 
uh, investigated just that possibility that this was kind of um, what we're seeing is sort of a uh, uh, an error that accrues uh, as your resolution goes down because you're looking at more and more distant galaxies with more and more distant Cepheids. So uh, we uh, turn that into a data analysis or mathematics problem and look to see does this tension or difference, does it increase as our resolution gets worse, as we look at further and further out things. And what we saw is that it does not increase. In fact, it stays very rock solid, I would say. Um, and so if it were the case that it was a problem with uh, being able to resolve uh, or isolate these Cepheids, then it ought to grow or become more problematic, more of a tension as you resolve less and less. And so that's not what we see. Well, you know, it's not easy because we have measured a lot about the universe and we do have a lot of data. So when coming up with some new physics that solves this problem, uh, it can't create new problems. Um, and so that is very challenging. Um, you know, I would say as of the last few months, some of the more attractive candidates have looked like another particle in the early history of the universe, what we call a relativistic particle, perhaps a neutrino. Um, another possibility is weird dark energy. Weird dark energy would mean that it's actually stronger or getting stronger than what we call the cosmological constant or basic vacuum energy. The expansion of the universe is accelerating. The most natural explanation, as I mentioned, is a cosmological constant, which energy density is constant. That's very, it's a very standard explanation. Now, the tension between the different measurements of the Hubble parameters mean that the, its value may not be quite the same different, depending on the scale it is measured at. So there's really three different routes to look at. Uh, one of them is to think that it really is just a cosmological constant that acts as dark energy. And the reason it leads to different uh, measurements of the Hubble parameter, depending on the scale, is because the rest of the matter, the stuff present in the universe, is behaving slightly differently. So that's the example, for instance, behind uh, decaying dark matter, where it can decay into something which dilutes more rapidly. There's the same thing with uh, uh, dark radiation. There's some component in the universe, which dilutes quite rapidly, and so it affects a little bit what we thought about the component of dark energy, its uh, current ratio over different scales. That radiation, so what is radiation? It's light, it's, it's massless particle, if you want to. If it's dark, we simply don't see it. So it's something that we behave like light, like radiation, but it is not that. So it, it's a in some sense, it's some new component in the universe which dilutes very rapidly, so it gets redshifted, just like lights get uh, redshifted, but we don't see it. Uh, there's no, it's not really photons made out of photons, it's probably made out of, of something else. And there's various candidates for that. Um, there can be extra dimensions, there can be other type of physics that would lead to this dark radiation. Maybe really the, <laughs> the issue is to do with the cosmological constant. Maybe it is not a constant. And that's the idea behind it being dynamical dark energy. So if it evolves in time, it could explain why the related Hubble parameter is slightly different on different scales. And so it changes a little bit our measurements of the Hubble parameter with different observations. And then finally, another explanation, possible explanation, is the fact that Maybe it is a cosmological constant. Maybe the rest of dark matter and all the rest of matter and radiation is precisely what we think it is. But simply the way they act on, on our space-time, on the expansion of the universe, is slightly different. And that would come from a modification of gravity. So by modify gravity, I really mean something which is slightly different than the laws of gravity dictated by Newton and then by Einstein. But they could be very small departures from it at very large distance scales, which um, could explain or help uh, explaining what dark energy is, or maybe even in some cases, some, there are some theoretical frameworks where it could help understanding what dark matter is. Anything that you invoke at early times, new physics that you invoke at early times, has to preserve the uh, uh, very, very good agreement uh, that we have with these precise measurements of the cosmic microwave background. So. It's not easy to introduce physics, new physics at late times or at early times to resolve this problem. So I think that's a real conundrum for uh, cosmology. 
Well, early on, I would say a few years ago, when we were first sort of seeing this tension and trying to understand it, um, you know, one could have simply said, you know, well, maybe it's just an error in a measurement, an error in the the uh, local measurement, an error in the early time measurement in the universe. And um, that explanation has become harder because there have now been so many independent cross checks that what we now have to say is if there's an error, it's actually a conspiracy of errors. There are multiple errors which are conspiring to make it look like this. And so that becomes less and less likely as it requires more and more conspiracies. There are a number of different ways of trying to work out you know, what the source of this tension is. Uh, some of them just involve getting uh, more data, particularly for the local distance ladder. Uh, we can't really do much better from the cosmic microwave background because we've observed the whole sky pretty much as well as we can. Um, but of course the way any astronomer really wants to solve a problem is by getting more data or, or different sorts of data. Um, and so there's a couple of new um, well, missions or experiments which are going to have some impact here. Uh, one obvious one is Gaia because uh, the main thing that the Gaia satellite will be doing is measuring very accurate parallaxes to nearby stars and from those parallaxes getting distances which is at the heart of the, the local distance ladder. And already actually the team led by Adam Rees that um, has been making these measurements have included Gaia data in their latest release and found that it hasn't made any difference yet to their conclusions. Um, I think probably the more, most exciting one is actually from gravitational waves. So in the last couple of years we've seen the fabulous discovery that we can detect gravitational waves or really the LIGO team and their instrument can detect gravitational waves from uh, well first coalescing black holes and now um, binary neutron stars coming together. And it turns out that these also give you a way to measure the accurate distance to an object. And so in you know, the next sort of five to 10 years or so, we should get sufficiently many of these binary neutron star events that will provide a completely independent and actually extremely direct measurement of the local expansion rate. So something that can be directly compared to the other two measurements and is completely independent of them. <laughs> Ask me today and tomorrow is going to be a different answer. I mean, we're always working on different models as we work through them. What's beautiful is that current observations from uh, gravitational waves have rolled out many models of dark energy. So we're really moving forward into understanding of the potential candidates, what they could be, what they could not be. We're moving forward. I guess uh, I'm betting at this point that something interesting is going on. And, uh, uh, you know, I would separate uninteresting from interesting you know uninteresting is you know whoops we uh, made a math error whoops we have a error in our computer code uh you know oops we forgot to correct for something that you know everybody knows you should account or correct for something interesting is, are things that uh we can't really think of right now we're not really sure um you know somebody may come along tomorrow with a physics explanation that would be interesting um you know i, I can't rule out some other kind of strange effect uh, but, you know, probably then not one that we have previously thought about. So, you know, as a scientist, this is sort of where you hope to get to is to learn interesting things about the universe by doing experiments. And so I think we're getting closer and closer to that point. So I think the most likely explanation is actually probably one of the uninteresting ones, that there's something subtle about the data that's currently being used to obtain these measurements of the Hubble constant that is, uh, you know, a assump wrong assumption or a wrong part of some analysis somewhere that means that actually the value is slightly off. It would be for tremendously exciting if it were some new uh, bit of cosmological physics that we didn't understand, but that's the sort of extraordinary claim which requires extraordinary evidence, and I just don't think that evidence is there yet. I'm working a lot on modified gravity, dark energy, so of course that's my favorite model, but that doesn't mean that uh, that's necessarily what it is. Uh, definitely the universe doesn't care. <laughs> about what I'm working on. Uh, yeah, but, but I, I think it's, it's important to keep an open mind. To, it, it's a big problem. It's, it's, and maybe it maybe is the sign of new physics, and so we should use it as an opportunity to, to explore new, new ways to tackle it. <laughs>